Well, good morning and welcome to today's webinar. A new topic and a very important one, financial exploitation, frauds and scams targeting seniors, presented by Mr. Andre Lingham, founder and president for the Center for Elder Justice and Education. My name is Jeff Stauffer, Community Relations Director with Elbow and Associates, and I'll be moderating today's event. To start, I'd like to mention this webinar is offered in partnership and with support from the Howard County Library System, a longtime supporter of Elbow and Associates educational programs. We'd like to thank the library system for promoting some of our events and being a great resource for the community. So how this will work today, if you're new to our webinars, if you are welcome, we're glad that you're here. And if you're a returning attendee, welcome back. So you as the attendee are in listen only mode. However, if you have questions, please note them in the questions panel on the right hand portion of your screen. And we will take all questions at the end of this morning's presentation. Your questions really help the presentation and add value. They help others learn. So please don't be shy in posing your questions at any time. Also for CFPs, CPAs, and various other professionals on today's webinar, you may receive 1.5 continuing education hours for attending. Also, per my attendance records requirements and reporting, please email me your ID number. And for CFPs only, I also must have the last four digits of your social security number as soon as possible so I can submit your CE hours for approval. Everyone will also receive a post webinar feedback email right after the presentation. And we ask you please just take a couple minutes to fill out this simple survey to offer us your feedback about the presentation. We read and value every comment. For example, we found this topic was often requested through our post webinar feedback. So we made arrangements to make this presentation a reality today. So here at Elvon Associates through planning and elder law techniques, techniques, our attorneys work every day with families and their loved ones with the ideals of client education, collaboration, and compassion in mind. We're always available for consultations to discuss your family's needs and look forward to being a resource to you in any way possible. So I have the true pleasure of introducing today's presenter, Mr. Andre Lingham. He is the founder and president for the Center of Elder Justice and Education, and the new website for the organization is www elderjusticeandeducation.org. The Center of Elder Justice and Education was established in 2021 and is a nonprofit organization that promotes elder abuse awareness and education. Its mission is done by virtual and in-person training to senior citizens, the general public, government agencies, police departments, and private institutions. Andre previously served over 30 years in law enforcement and retired from the Howard County Police Department in 2019 to focus full-time on elder abuse awareness and education. While a member of the Howard County Police Department, he served as the senior citizen liaison for five years. In 2014, Andre was named Howard County Police Officer of the Year and 2015 American Legion Law Enforcement Officer of the Year for his work educating and protecting seniors. Andre resides in Columbia, and as a caregiver for his 86 year old mother. So Andre, thank you for being here today. We appreciate your time. And also thank you for your service to our community. And I will turn it over to you. Good morning, Jeff. I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, thanks for the invitation. So again, we're, we're going to look at elder financial exploitation. Um, it's also been called the crime of the 21st century. Um, so we look when we look at the general definition of financial exploitation, it's the illegal taking, misuse, or concealment of an older person's funds, property, and assets. And we'll get into each one of those um, throughout the presentation. Uh, so some little known facts. It's estimated that seniors lose between $3 billion and $36 billion per year. It's really hard to put a number on that because seniors very often uh, won't report that they've been victimized. Um, during COVID, uh, seniors lost about $600 million to frauds and scams in general, and about $100 million directly related to COVID-19 scams. Seniors are often targeted for re-victimization. Basically, re-victimization is when a senior, say, falls victim to a foreign lottery scam. Um, several months after it happens, um, they'll get a call from a quote-unquote government official 
uh, claiming that they can help them get their money back, but they'll need to provide all their personal information and also pay a fee to um, recover their money. Again, it's, it's re-victimizing them um, from being scammed. Unfortunately, family members and friends are the largest group of offenders, and we'll talk about those later in the uh, presentation. Um, so why are seniors targets of financial crimes? One of the biggest things we see is as, as we get older, um, our cognitive ability uh, diminishes. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of victims um, have dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, seniors tend to be trusting and believe sales pitches. Um, I'm mostly attached, attached or dependent on others. Um, I had a case where a senior was homebound and she gave her granddaughter her credit card to pick up medicine, um, food, make different purchases. And unfortunately, her granddaughter charged over $10,000 on um, the senior's credit card. Um, it came to our attention um, because the, the senior wanted the charges taken off. Unfortunately, um, she didn't want to go forward with pressing charges, so she ended up having to pay the um, total amount that was charged by her granddaughter. Um, again, it seems they're reluctant to report exploitation by a family member or friend. Um, in my five years, I only had one senior that reported that she was being victimized or scammed. It typically came from a family member or a third party. Um, Advances in technology it has made it really difficult for seniors to, to keep up with uh, banking and, and different things like that. Typically, what you'll see is uh, one spouse will pass away that managed all the finances, and the surviving spouse really isn't comfortable doing that. So they'll turn everything over to a friend, a, a family member, or an accountant for them to manage everything. Um, suffer from isolation and loneliness. A lot of times it can be um, self-imposed isolation. Um, and that's where the uh, phone scammers um, will target uh, those seniors. Um, easily intimidated. Um, this next, um, it's an audio tape of a senior that was uh, being victimized by the foreign lottery scam. Um, she decided not to send, send them any more money, so they um, decided to start threatening her. And here's a recording of the audio. Hey. The last thing he said is, do you want me to come over there and set your home on fire? So typically what they'll do is go on Google Maps because they have the senior's address and they'll get a photo or picture of the senior's home. So the next message they'll leave is um, they'll call and say, hey, we were by your house and you know we know that you have a shed out in the backyard with ravens on it. Or they'll pick something specific to that house to really intimidate the senior and to get them to believe that they were actually by their house. Uh, some red flags and warning signs. It could be any one of these, but uh, the ones we typically see the most are unusual activity on bank accounts, large withdrawals or unexplained withdrawals, and sudden failures to pay bills. Um, also mood changes such as anxiety or depression. Um, and that typically happens once all their finances are gone and they, they're trying to figure out how they're going to make their mortgage payment, pay for medication, or just daily living expenses. Um, this is Doug Shadell, and he gives you uh, insight into the scammer's mindset. We always ask them the same question. What is your central strategy for defrauding people? They all say the same thing. Get them under the ether. Under the ether. Ether is a heightened emotional state where you're no longer thinking rationally, but you're reacting emotionally. And this explains why so many people actually fall in for this stuff. You say, how could somebody that smart fall for this? It's not their intellect that's engaged when they make that decision. It's the emotion. It all boils down to emotion and, and getting you to believe what they want you to believe or to scare you into believing that.
Uh, so we're going to look at some types of financial exploitation. We're going to start with strangers, and these could be salesmen, door-to-door -door salesmen, uh, contractors, con artists. Um, one of the ways that they want you to send them money is through the green dot card. Um, that's a prepaid money card. So they'll tell you um, for whatever scam they're running, we need you to put you know X amount of dollars on a green dot card. Once you put money on that card, um, they'll ask for the number on the back of it. Once you give them the number, they immediately transfer the money on the card to another account and the money's gone. Also, they'll typically use um, iTunes gift cards, um, Western Union or MoneyGram also for you to um, wire them or send them money. Um, one of the popular scams out there is a grandparent scam. And this is when they typically um, contact a senior claiming to be a grandson or granddaughter in distress. Um, uh, the video I'm about to play is an interview with one of the scammers, and he kind of goes into how um, the scam works and, um, you know, how to minimize being victimized by it. Morning, Charlie. The scam begins with something most grandparents don't get enough, a phone call from a grandchild, or so the caller says. But it almost always ends with a desperate plea for money, and the criminal you're about to meet used to be on the other end of the line. Shackled in federal custody, this 31-year-old con man is awaiting sentencing in California for his role in what's known as the grandparent scam. He agreed to let us in on how he did it, but only if we wouldn't reveal his name. You can make 10 grand sometimes in a day if you do it properly. Part of an elaborate scheme run out of Canada, he would call senior citizens in the U.S., impersonating a grandchild in distress begging for cash. Give me an idea of how a typical call would go. So you just say, hey, how are you? Hi, hi, Grandma, hi, Grandpa. I'm under the weather, it's a bad connection. I'm in a little bit of trouble right now. If I tell you, just keep it between us. I'm on vacation, but I got into a little accident and, and you know, I, I was arrested for DUI. You tell them things got out of control and, and uh, I need to send me the money. How many people would fall for this? One out of 50, maybe. It's estimated senior citizens are robbed of roughly $3 billion a year in financial scams. Phone scams are often run outside the U.S., out of boiler rooms like this one busted in Canada last year. And con artists usually buy their victims personal information online, including age and income. We target people uh, over the age of 65, mainly, because they're, they're more gullible, they're at home, they're more accessible. Once you get them emotionally involved, then then they'll do anything for you, basically. Doug Shadell is with AARP. We've had doctors and lawyers fall for this. It doesn't really matter what your educational level is because it triggers something emotional that causes you to act. I was upset and sort of frantic. It happened to this 81-year-old grandmother. She was home alone in California last September when her phone rang. Hello? The caller said he was her 29-year-old grandson, arrested for driving drunk in North Carolina. There was a desperation and an urgency in his voice, partly because he said, love you. Did it sound like him? No, but he said he had a broken nose. I just wanted him to be home with his family. I just, that's all I wanted. So she immediately sent almost $18,000 to a bank account in North Carolina, thinking it was going to a lawyer. But her grandson wasn't in jail and wasn't in North Carolina. Her money was gone. A couple of things with this, um, one in 50 fall victim, it's pretty easy to make 50 phone calls and $10,000 a day. So it's it, it's really a lot of uh, money involved in this, this scam. Also, again, it boils down to getting your victim to be mostly involved. Um, another scam out there is a jury duty scam, um, and basically they'll call you um, claiming to be a, a court official and telling you there's an arrest warrant out for you because you missed jury duty. Um, you can get the warrant lifted by paying them money. They'll also want you to confirm your name, address, social security number, date of birth, and other personal identifying information. Um, the Howard County um, Sheriff's Office just put out a press release um, 
recently because that scam is actually going on as we speak and they're actually using Howard County deputies names to um, try to perpetrate this scam. So again, if you get a phone call from someone claiming to be from the court, um, just ignore it, just ignore it. Uh, Microsoft computer scam. I, um, I get these calls typically once or twice a week and it'll be from someone claiming to be from Microsoft and that my uh, subscription has expired and yeah, in order to keep using their products, I'm gonna have to pay for a new subscription. Um, please just ignore that, it's another scam. Um, Nigerian letter or email, typically these will be in the form of an email. Um, it'll be uh, some kind of government official from Nigeria that has millions of dollars in an account in Nigeria, but unfortunately it's um, frozen and they can only get a release to a, an account in the United States. Uh, what they'll want you to do is provide your bank information for them to transfer the money um, to your account. Again, it's one of the biggest scams out there. Um, and they'll also want you to um, provide a, a good faith uh, payment. So they'll say, um, yeah, we're going to transfer a million dollars to your account, but you need to send us $30,000 because um, who knows, you may get the million dollars and we may not be able to access it. So you're getting victimized by sending them money. Um, please ignore any kind of correspondence from any government official um, outside the country. Um, these are your typical telemarketing scams. Um, and these are your regular phone calls that you get offering different uh, uh, products. Um, travel packages, uh, home improvement schemes, different things like that. Some of the tip-offs are, you must act now or the offer won't be good. You gotta make the decision. If, if you don't, we're gonna move on to the next person. One of a few people eligible. Uh, we decided to pick 30 people in Colombia to offer this great prize to, and you're one of the 30 that we chose. Um, we'll need your personal information for verification. Uh, Ms. Johnson, we need your um, full name, your full address, um, social security number, date of birth, and your driver's license. Again, that opens you up to identity theft fraud. Um, you want a free gift, but you have to pay for uh, postage and handling fees. Uh, another scam out there that's uh, pretty common is home repair contractors. These are the guys that knock on your door offering home repair services and typically i start off by saying hey we're doing work at your neighbor's house down the street and we see that uh you know you could use some home repairs um typically these guys are unlicensed and they basically go from door to door offering services so some things to uh, look out for is make sure they're licensed with the maryland home improvement commission Every uh, home improvement company has to be licensed in the state of Maryland. Um, get a written contract and you have three days right of refusal. So if you enter an, an agreement with a company to do work, you have three days to back out of it without any penalty. Um, get more than one estimate. Um, then this is key, pay only one third of the contract price as a down payment. Please do not pay the, whole, the full amount. Um, typically, it's one third down in the beginning, one third halfway, and then the final at the end of the project. And don't obtain permits yourself. Reason being, if you obtain a permit yourself and it's something wrong in the permit or, or the request, um, it's up to you or you can be uh, penalized. If the contractor does it, it's up to them to fix it. This is one of the big ones that really don't get the attention that it should. It's uh, tree trimming and tree cutting scams. And again, what these guys will do is go around from house to house offering tree trimming and tree cutting services. Typically they're from Culpeper, Virginia, and they will come up every day to Howard County, Montgomery County, um, PG County, different places like that, and go door to door offering services. Um, some of the things you need to look out for is never enter into agreement with tree trimmers soliciting door to door. I can guarantee you that they're not licensed. 
Um, the state of Maryland requires that any work done on a tree that's over 20 feet tall, the company must have a tree expert license and insurance. Make sure you get copies of that. Once you get copies, also, um, you can contact the Department of Natural Resources to confirm that it is an authentic license. We've seen them actually make up licenses and, and give to um, victims, unfortunately. And get and keep a written contract. A lot of times what they'll do, especially with older seniors, is they'll have them sign a contract and then they'll take the contract. So the senior won't have a copy of anything. Um, pay by check and make payable to a business only. Only A lot of times they will want you to put the uh, make the check out to a, a specific person. That's one a sign that they're not um, licensed. Um, so uh, Mr. Defferball, I um, had the unfortunate, uh, um, ran into him at my neighbor's house. Uh, he was attempting to um, cut trees down and defraud her. Luckily, I intervened and and uh, he moved on. Several months later, um, I got a call from a senior in Elkridge that uh, he thought he may have been, been scammed. Um, and so I went and met with him and um, apparently Mr. Defaball had gone to his house and offered to cut down four trees that were diseased uh, for $12,000. Um, so I followed up with the Department of Natural Resources. I had them come out to inspect the trees. The trees were perfectly fine. They didn't have any issues with them. Um, and my victim had written a check out specifically to Mr. Defaball. Um, and what Mr. Defaball would do is go to liquor stores and cash the checks. I followed up uh, with the liquor store that he would typically get the uh, um, checks cashed, and he had cashed over $30,000 in one month of uh, checks made out specifically to him. Um, so I consulted with the state's attorney, and we decided to charge uh, Mr. Defaball with fraud, theft, and destruction of property. We proved that the trees uh, were in perfect uh, condition, didn't have any issues with them. Um, and we got a conviction and he was sentenced to six months in jail. Um, when a, another big scam out there is lottery and sweepstakes. And typically what they'll do is you'll get receive a letter that you want X amount of dollars, but you have to pay the taxes. Um, unfortunately, once you respond to one of these letters, the floodgates will open and where you'll get five, six, seven letters a day. Um, a lot of times what they'll do also is offer to pay for the taxes. So they'll send you a letter saying you won and that they're also going to pay for the taxes. So they'll send you a check for you to deposit, but then you have to send them a check for the exact amount. So once you deposit that check, of course, it's, it's, it's not valid and it's a bogus check. And then you've already sent your check. They received it and cashed it. Um, here's a um, interview with a um, young lady whose parents had fallen victim to the foreign lottery scam. Donna Parker can't help but feel guilty. I, yeah, I felt stupid. I mean, it's like, I should have known. I should have looked. I should have paid attention. But I didn't. By the time she figured out what was happening, her elderly parents were hundreds of thousands in debt. And I just spent all this time going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. By phone and mail, a ring of Canadian sweepstakes scammers had tricked Charles and Miriam Parker into giving away their life savings. And before it was over, the highly educated couple had become unwitting accomplices in what officials say is a $3 billion a year racket. I've been on house calls with older adults who where there have been concerns about abuse or neglect, and literally not 60 seconds would go by that that phone wasn't ringing. And I would pick up the phone and say hello, and it was, you know, a Nigerian princess or somebody in the Canadian lottery. FBI agent Joan Fleming handled the Parker case and says the problem is getting worse every year. I'm seeing uh, larger amounts of money from single victims reported. You know, six figures is, is not unusual. But what makes the Parker case unusual 
is that after they'd been cleaned out, the couple became what authorities call money mules. The scammers would have other elderly victims send cash to the Parkers, hidden in old magazines. Mrs. Parker would then repackage it and forward it to Montreal. Having the money hopscotch from one victim to another makes it much more complicated. The Parker's troubles began sometime in late 2004. I knew my dad had a good retirement. I, I knew for years they'd been able, after he retired, been able to live within their means. Then all of a sudden, they couldn't. Like many victims, her parents hadn't been diagnosed with dementia or any other mental deficiency. Even in the really early stages before you have Alzheimer's, like mild cognitive impairment, you become more vulnerable to, to getting scammed. Everybody said to me, it's their money. It's their money. After nearly four years of struggle, the Parker children sued to have their parents declared financially incompetent. You know how hard that is to take your parents to court? The one thing my dad kept saying was, I am not mentally incompetent. I am not mentally incompetent. The man the Parkers knew over the phone as Howard Clark was really Clayton Atkinson, a Canadian with a lengthy criminal record. He pleaded guilty in March and is serving 12 and a half years in a federal prison. The couple lost more than $200,000 to this and other scams. I think they are the lowest of the low. To this day, I don't understand why two perfectly intelligent people just didn't finally say, forget it. Nothing's ever coming through, forget it. And they never did. Here's a um, case that I worked on. Um, it was an 83 year old uh, victim lived in uh, Ellicott City with her husband. Um, she received a call that uh, she had won millions from the foreign lottery and the BMW, but she had to pay the taxes. Um, the taxes would have been $12,000. So she went to a local bank to uh, withdraw the, the $12,000. And luckily, a um, teller um, thought it was a scam and directed her to the uh, bank manager. Um, so she met with the bank manager and told him that, you know, she had won millions and uh, just needed her $12,000 um, so she could send them to, uh, you know, get her prize. Um, Fortunately, the bank manager contacted um, Howard County Police. Officer went out. Um, she basically told the officer, I don't want your help. I just want my $12,000. Um, luckily, the officer got her name um, and she received the $12,000 left. He contacted uh, me and I went and met with her um, the next day. Um, after a while, she kind of opened up to me and told me that she had um, sent the money FedEx to um, a location in the U.S. but wouldn't tell me where it was, uh, where, where it was going, who it was addressed to or anything like that. Um, she did tell me it was uh, sent by FedEx. So I went to the closest FedEx to her house and actually found the package there. Um, so I had a decision to make, um, seize the package, but I would have had to give it back to her and she just would have turned around and sent it, sent it out or let it go through. Um, so I saw that it was going to Covington, Kentucky, which is a small town. So um, based on that, I decided to let the um, let the uh, package go through. If it was going to a major city, New York, Chicago, or wherever, I probably just would have seized it. But I figured I could get some help from the local police department in Kentucky. So I actually um, contacted a detective down there and, and, and told him what was going on, gave um, him the information, the address, where it was going, who it was addressed to, and it was addressed to Jake Grout. Um, the detective uh, advised me, oh yeah, we've uh, had several conversations with Mr. Grout. Apparently he was the money mule, so he would get the money sent to him, um, take a 10% cut, and then send it to Nigeria, Jamaica, wherever they wanted him to send the money. Um, so he ultimately was um, charged and convicted of fraud and was sentenced to five years in the um, uh, Kentucky State Penitentiary. Um, so that was a good outcome with that case. Um, we did recover the money. Um, and about six months later, I got a call from my victim's son saying that she was at the uh, FedEx store in uh, by Columbia Mall. 
and she was attempting to send more money out. Um, and unfortunately, that's what you see a lot of times. These seniors will continue to send money. One way or another, they just want that prize to come through. So I, I met with her at the um, uh, FedEx, um, found out she was sending $17,000, um, tried to talk her out of it. Um, she wouldn't listen to me. So I decided to, you know, I told her, I said, I'm just going to leave. If you want to lose your money, that's fine. You can lose it. So I walked out and she completed the uh, transaction. And once she left, I went back in and seized it. Um, this time it was $17,000. Um, so I, I recovered close to $30,000 for her that she had sent, was going to send in cash um, to, to these scammers. Um, ultimately, her son got uh, conservatorship over her and the funds was turned over to him. So that was a good outcome of that story. But that very, very rarely happens. Typically, once the money's gone, um, it's gone. Um, the IRS tax scam. These guys will typically call, claim to be from the IRS and that you owe back taxes and there's an arrest warrant for you. But you can clear up the arrest warrant by paying them money. And typically, again, through the Green Dot card or, or um, MoneyGram, Western Union, iTunes gift cards. Again, the IRS will only send registered letters and will not call you directly. Um, online romance scam. Um, this is uh, one that I would see quite a bit when I was on the police department. Um, and typically, um, a senior would, would go online to these date sites and, and uh, would start getting responses. Um, this is a video of a victim, and she goes into, um, you know, how she was victimized. After this, we'll do a case study of a case that I worked on in Howard County. I'm lonely, so, and I spent a lot of time on the computer playing games. And I just happened to go to the date site. When Jenna Cook went looking for love online, 17 years after losing her husband, she found a suitor on the very first day. I liked him because he was, he said sweet things and he was, he was very charming. After four months of courtship, including emails and phone calls, but never meeting in person, the man who claimed to be a contractor from Virginia was suddenly stuck somewhere in Africa and in serious trouble. According to the story, he became very ill and um, he was in the hospital. He claimed to have had a kidney transplant and it was like $4,000 a month. I was really worried about him. I thought the man was going to die. The money started to add up and before Janet realized she was being swindled, the 76-year-old widow was out roughly $300,000. These are people who have worked so hard for their savings and now they're giving it all away to the romance scammers. Barbara Hannah Grufferman is with AARP. The organization is now warning members that seniors are a prime target for online dating scams. The studies show that as you get older, your ability to decipher deceit declines. That means that as you get older, you have to be even more vigilant. So here's the case that I worked on uh, in Howard County and profile of my victim, 67 year old retired doctor, um, early onset of dementia. Um, so she had a profile. Um, she had placed a profile on Facebook and um, someone had contacted her in, J in January of 2017. Um, and typically what they'll do, once they initiate contact, they'll want you to go to a private uh, communication site, which turned out to be Vipe. Um, and it's really, really hard to, to trace um, anyone on those those sites and to get accurate information if you need to follow up from a law enforcement uh, perspective. Um, so suspect stated he was from Texas working on an oil rig in the Gulf of uh, New Mexico, Gulf of Mexico. Um, they communicated for about four months um, through email and over the phone. Um, several times he produced false um, tickets um, stating that he was going to visit her and you know they, they were eventually going to move to um, Florida and live happily ever after. Um, on the last, uh, one of the last times that he was scheduled to visit her, 
he um, advised her that he had to pay some employees some back um, um, back wages and wasn't able to leave the country um, until he paid those wages. Um, and he came in with a few other um, excuses, um, needing to buy equipment, different things like that. So in total, these are the wire transfers she did over a three week period, $76,000. $56,000, $56,000. Both of those were made on the same day. $55,000, $250,000, So a total of close to $600,000. Um, and these were actually wire transfers that I, I actually saw. Um, Unfortunately, the, the, the bank where she sent these red flags should have gone up. She was transferring a lot of money in a short period of time overseas. And unfortunately, they didn't catch that. Um, and um, so unfortunately, she was out of it. Um, I contacted the FBI. This was one of the only cases that, um, that they actually took and would follow up on. Um, speaking with the agent, she advised that they get numerous cases daily of, you know, wire transfers from online romance scams in the hundreds of thousands, sometimes in the millions of dollars. So it's very, very lucrative to these scammers, and they really, really get away with it, unfortunately. Um, the next one is the um, sweetheart swindle. Um, and basically, it plays on the online romance scam, except that they actually meet you in person. And typically what they'll do is target um, an area, like say Double T Dine or a place where seniors go to have breakfast. And they'll go and, you know, for a week or two weeks, and then they'll see that one senior that's there every morning by him or herself. And then they'll uh, come up with a reason to contact them and have conversation. And unfortunately, um, over time, they'll engage in a bogus, you know, romantic relationship. Sometimes it's not romantic, it's just friendship. And they'll offer to do things around the house. Um, they'll bring their kids around and they'll make sure they're, they're dressed pretty bad and, you know, in torn clothes. And, and, uh, and then they'll want the senior to help them out, take them to the store to purchase things, give them loans. Um, unfortunately, that's all they want is the money involved in that. Um, after the money is gone, typically the con artist is gone. Uh, so now we're going to look at um, known person exploitation. Um, and unfortunately, this is the largest group of offenders, and this could be adult children, um, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, distant relatives, but typically they target seniors who they know will give them money, or a lot of times they'll ask to borrow money with no intentions on giving the money back. Um, again, it, it's unfortunately the largest group of offenders. Also acquaintances um, could be handyman men, um, church members. I had a case once where a church member scammed another church member out of $50,000 and had her unfortunately sign over the deed to her house um, without the other family members knowing. Um, had several cases involving handymen. Um, this one handyman would typically go to a senior's house um, three, four times a week and do odd jobs, cutting the grass three times a week, uh, painting or doing different things. And unfortunately, the senior was intimidated and he just kept paying money um, to the tune of about four or five hundred dollars per week. And this went on for several months until a neighbor sort of intervened and, and uh, we got involved in it. And, uh, but unfortunately it happens uh, quite a bit. Um, also professional caregivers. Um, as uh, Jeff said, I'm a caregiver for my mom and we have a home health aide that comes in um, three times a week to um, help her with their shower. Um, you gotta really be careful with, um, hiring caregivers or professional caregivers or people that you allow into your house. Some of the things you should look for is 
make sure the uh, person completes an employment application. Um, tip, I use an agency, so that's all done, so I don't have to worry about that. But if you're hiring a person as an individual, you wanna make sure you have all the information on them. Um, I had several, several cases where um, there's suspected theft and fraud, and you know, I'll ask for, okay, um, did they complete an, an application or what information do you have? Most of them would have just first and last name and that was it, and maybe an address. Um, conduct a thorough background check. When you hire a major agency, they typically do that. Um, but hiring an individual person, you can go through the state police and do a uh, have a background check done on them or you can use the state judicial um, database where all um, crimes or people charged with crimes, traffic offenses, civil cases uh, are available for the public to see. Um, make sure you write out a job description and job contract. You want them to know specifically what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Um, Avoid the revolving door caregiver. These are the caregivers that go from place to place, um, typically every month or two months. There's a reason that they're going from place to place. Photograph and secure valuable items. Um, make sure um, you know jewelry, different things like that are not in plain view and put away. And monitor, monitor, monitor. If you hire someone, just don't just you know make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do and monitor accounts um, property all that stuff here's a case that uh originated in montgomery county and it's, it was sort of uh, uh sweetheart swindle with home care um and we'll discuss it after the video. She faked her love for an 87-year-old man and then nearly wiped out his bank account on clothing, cars, and jewelry. Well, today, the woman known as the sweetheart swindler is headed to prison. Montgomery County reporter Kevin Lewis is live in Rockville with the sentence the judge handed down. Kevin. Hi there, Allison. Rosetta Horn will spend the next five years behind bars. When she gets out, the punishment continues with restitution to the tune of 400 grand. And tonight, Horn's family says this was all one big misunderstanding. They were together and they love each other. Her daughter calls it romance, but prosecutors equated Rosetta Horn to a flirty thief. She was hired to care for an 87-year-old man with dementia. Instead, she used the man's money to buy designer watches, fancy purses, even an $86,000 Audi sedan. That's Horn at Saks Fifth Avenue. And here's Horn at the victim's bank. In total, she stole $404,000. Did your mother truly love him? I can't believe y'all in my face like this. Can y'all move, please? Are y'all violating my rights? She did not spare herself any extravagance. Prosecutors say Horn was so unremorseful, she used her illegally purchased Audi to drive to and from trial. She became in love with it, not him, I think, but the extravagant lifestyle that his money afforded her. That's what this case is about. Horn's attorney disappointed with the outcome in this fraud to fashion case. You're not happy with the sentencing? No. Why is that? Because she's 66 years of age and she's got a lot of problems. He will put her in jail. So the state says that she swindled an old man out of a lot of money. There was a lot of money involved. That's all. And get this, prosecutors say Horn, who's again 66 years old, went so far as to pretend she was pregnant with that 87-year-old man's child. Tonight, that man barely has enough money to afford a nursing home. We're live at Circuit Court in Rockville. Um, um, very scary. Unfortunately, he lost his his whole life savings. Um, again, it goes back to monitor, monitor, monitor. Um, that should have never happened if someone had been keeping an eye on his finances, uh, what was going on. I think they probably was, you know, became comfortable because she was an older lady and came across as very nice and, and you know, looking just to, just to help out and take care of him. Um, but again, monitor, monitor, monitor. Um, so we're finished up with this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about power of attorney. Um, the power of attorney is a document that gives authority for one person to act for another person in some or all legal 
and financial matters. Um, from the law enforcement side, we used to call it a weapon and a shield. And what I mean by that is the weapon would be what the agent would use to, to victimize the uh, person or steal from them. The shield is what they would use um, when we interviewed them and they would say, oh, no, 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 I have a power of attorney in place and uh, it gives me the authorization to, you know, make transactions to do whatever it says in there. Um, it says that ultimately you have a fiduciary responsibility as an agent. Um, power of attorneys are not to line your pockets. It's not to pay your bills. It, it's not to um, pay friend, give friends money or anything like that. It's, it's basically to, for the senior or whoever the person that you the um, designated agent for. Um, so some safety tips is only get one if you need one or um, have a springing power of attorney that goes into a, an effect when a specific uh, thing happens or you're incapacitated. Um, this is key, very, very key. Have it prepared by an attorney. I know a great attorney's office, uh, I think his name is Steve Elville. Um, that's what they do. So um, again, um, everyone has different assets property, um, different things. So having a, an, an attorney prepare it for, for what best fits your situation. Um, understand what a gifting clause is. Um, a gifting clause allows the agent to make gifts on your behalf to um, whoever um, they decide that uh, is within the power of attorney. Um, this is key also, make sure the person you're giving it to is financially responsible. If they're borrowing money from you or they can't pay their bills or they're having issues financially, it's the last person that you want to give power of attorney to. Um, be specific and document what and what not is allowed. Um, again, each one of us has different lifestyle, different situation. You may be, uh, you know, you may want to have it set up where it's very narrow, um, where the agent can only do certain things, or if you want it wide open, where they can do anything. But it's totally up to you and how you um, set it up. Um, another thing you could do is include third-party monitoring, and basically what that is is, um, and however you set it up, you could say um, every 90 days I want my agent to provide to my account, everything that was done on my behalf. It's just another layer of safety. Um, here's a um, power of attorney case that I worked on. Um, my victim was 70 years of age, um, had some medical issues, lived in uh, PG County, sold her house and, and made about $140,000. Um, she entered into a li assisted living facility in Howard County. Um, after a few months there, the um, suspect, who was a grandson, decided to take her out of the assisted living and um, basically said she couldn't afford to pay the rent, so he would take her in. Also, she was given about a year to live. Um, so she named him as uh, her power of attorney. Um, so the suspect is Seth Lee. Lives in Columbia, lived in Columbia with wife, three kids. Both suspect and wife were unemployed at the time, dr drug and alcohol abuse, and numerous calls for domestic incidents at the home. So a total recipe for disaster. Um, so we got the case through Adult Protective Services and initiated an investigation. So in one month's time, we um, pulled uh, her bank records, and these are some of the transactions. Um, 32 fast food bar purchases for about $900, 10 ATM withdrawals, um, U.S. Postal Service, and we never really figured out what this was for, but we believe it was for money orders, uh, miscellaneous debits from her card, um, House of Tropicals bought a huge fish tank for $1,200, um, Plastic Surgery Center, $3,000 two transactions for uh, the plastic surgery center. Um, he got his uh, wife's um, breast implants. So we um, called him in for an interview and he came in with his attorney. And first thing they said was, well, we have a power of attorney and um, 
you know, it says we can basically do whatever we want to do. Um, of course, we disagreed with that and challenged them. Um, ultimately, he was charged and he pled guilty to embezzlement and theft. Um, unfortunately, received no jail time and was supposed to pay restitution. Uh, his grandmother passed away several months um, after the, the case was adjudicated. Um, but we did uh, get a, get a um, conviction for a felony, felony theft. Um, unfortunately, most of these cases that we got for power of attorney um, issues um, or potential fraud never made it to court. And unfortunately, the state's attorney, not all of them, but a few of them would uh, want to leave it as a civil matter. Um, so this um, final video of uh, Mickey Rooney, um, who was a child star and um, you know, lived until his 80s in, in Hollywood, and he was a victim of financial exploitation. And he goes into how it affected him and and um, and how it really changed his life. I have worked almost my entire lifetime in the business I love to entertain and please other people. I am here today because it's it's so important that I share my story with others. I was unable to avoid becoming a victim of elder abuse. Elder abuse comes in many, many different forms, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and financial abuse. Even with success, my monetary thing called money was stolen from me, yet stolen by someone close. Many times, sadly, as with my situation, the elder abuse involves, it involves a family member. You feel scared, disappointed, yes, and angry. And you can't believe that it's happening to you. You feel you feel overwhelmed. The strength you need to fight it. You can be in control of your life one minute, ladies and gentlemen, and in the next minute, like that, you have absolutely, believe it or not, no control of your life. Sometimes this happens quickly, but other times it's very, very gradual over the course of time my daily life became my daily life became unbearable because all of this seemed to come out of nowhere at first it was something small that I could control it but then it became something sinister that was completely out of my control I felt trapped, scared, used, and frustrated. I came here for you to think of the literally millions of seniors who are abused. You're not alone. And you have nothing, nothing, ladies and gentlemen, to be ashamed of. You deserve, yes, you deserve better. You all have the right to control your own life. Everyone does. You have the right to control your life and be happy. Please, for yourself, end the cycle of abuse. Do not allow yourself to be silenced anymore. Tell your story to anyone, someone, and let them know the elder abuse happened to me. That's why I'm here to tell you a little about it. To me, Mickey Rooney. <laughs> and if it can happen to me, 
Oh, God willing it and unwilling it, it can happen to anyone. I'm asking you to stop this of elderly abuse. I mean, to stop it and end it and say that it's a crime. And we will not allow it in the United States of America. Very compelling. Um, I'll end on this. Each one of you, please educate one. It's really the only way we can uh, minimize um, seniors being victimized is by getting the information out there. Um, and that's why I do what I do. Um, I, I really like to go directly to seniors to educate them. Um, far too often we see a lot of big agencies and you know they'll put press releases out or everything's on the internet. But I, I, I truly feel that getting out where seniors are and talking directly to them has a huge impact on trying to minimize um, seniors being victimized. So I really want to thank uh, Steve and his staff for inviting me, and hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, it's a little different for me going to virtual because I'm a very, uh, I like to interact with my audience, so it's a, a little different uh, for me doing it this way. But any way for me to get the information out there is, is what I'll do. Um, so I guess we can take a few questions now. Very well, Andre. Thank you so much. Um, what a what a great presentation, um, and the way you way you shared it, and um, the information shared is uh, so important to um, people on this call and um, and the people that um, you know they live with and work with. And um, you know, again, if they can share it with somebody else. That would be um, a great service. So. I mean, the information is almost unbelievable, um, but all too real um, in in every case. So, um, again, very important. We we thank you for being here today. Um, and so we'll we'll go ahead and jump into some questions here. So, um, if you do have a question for Andre, um, now would be your time to go ahead and get that question in, please. We do have some, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, and try to get through them here. Um, so the first question we have here, it says, um, I was recently a victim of a clever online scam. Once I realized what happened, I called the Howard County Police Department to report the scam. I was told there is nothing they can do as they have no resources to deal with online issues. If true, shouldn't the police be able to respond? Exactly. Um, I was in law enforcement for 30 years, and I can tell you one of my biggest frustrations was when I was um, the senior liaison, a lot of these cases were pushed aside as a civil matter. Um, they still should have taken a report. Unfortunately, it's not a whole lot that we can do um, as far as tracking where it's going, because literally, as you saw in the um, presentation, a hopscotch from America to, to Jamaica to, to wherever. Um, but they still have, should have taken a uh, report. Prime example is if, uh, if the officer hadn't contacted me in reference to the foreign lottery scam um, and a, say a patrol officer had gone out, they probably wouldn't have done much. Um, I'm you know trained on following up on these. So I kind of knew how to to manage it and and where to go and what to look for and ultimately we got a conviction out of it and she got thirty thousand dollars back um, but again um, unfortunately law enforcement really isn't isn't trained um, to um, to follow up on these um, if you like you can reach out to me through my uh, website and you know I can I still have contacts there so if you'd like a formal report we can still I can make sure we get that done. Thank you. Uh, next question um, is, I receive numerous spam emails every day that are scams. Isn't there some way to prosecute these people for attempted theft? Typically that falls on the federal government, um, unless you can prove that even though it's targeted locally, um, they typically come from out of the country. And we're so inundated with them now 
Um, unfortunately, the, the prosecution rate or even the investigative rate is probably less than 1%. So I think, you know, being honest, the, the best way to um, deal with those is just ignore them. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we live in a global economy and global world where everything's interconnected. So most of them originate out of the country. And uh, I can tell you, I approached the FBI several times on different scams, and if it really didn't have good follow-up information, they just wouldn't take them. Okay, a uh, couple comments here. Everything stated is so much of a reality check. I received the form of everything being stated, wonderful information. So thank you, thank you thank for you. that comment. Um, Merrill, um, a very good friend of the firm here. Um, Regarding spam calls, what is the best way to handle spam calls? Ignore them or don't answer. And also, is the do not call line still active and viable? Um, typically, just ignore, uh, ignore them. Um, if you don't recognize the number, don't answer. Unfortunately, I get numbers from out of state and you know from various places, so I have to answer my phone. Typically, if I don't get a person within one second, I just hang up. Because typically they'll call and it's a ro sort of robo call and there'll be a delay um, until for someone to pick up. So I'll just just ignore it. Um, do not, the do not call list um, is really for legitimate companies. <laughs> um, so the scammers don't, you know, go with the do not call list. They they really don't care. So those are for legitimate companies that you, you know, you don't want calling you. Um, so one thing I've learned, these scams are going to continue because it's very lucrative. Billions of dollars are lost every year. So the best thing you can do is, is protect yourself by being educated. Very good. Regarding the um, situation you discussed uh, regarding the checks being cashed at the liquor store. Can the victim sue or authorities charge the liquor store that cashed the victim's checks? So it's interesting. I, um, like I said, it was $30,000 in one month. I contacted the IRS because clearly that's evasion of taxes. <laughs> and it was in Virginia. Um, I contacted them, gave them all the information and they did not follow up on it, unfortunately. And I also contacted the attorney general um, in Virginia to let them know also. And I'm not sure what happened after that, but I did take those steps to try to, because I mean, that, that was an easy case. I mean, I had all the checks that he had cashed uh, within that one month period. That's a lot of money for, for tree trimming within one month, $30,000. Um, so it's, it's very lucrative, very lucrative. There was a victim in, uh, Montgomery County, I think, lost over three hundred thousand dollars to tree trimming scams. So it's uh, it, it's scary. Yeah. Uh, next question: If you, for example, have a quote call pepper suspected group stop by, even if you just ignore them, should one report it or alert someone? Yes, I would uh, contact the uh, police department and their solicitors going from door to door. Um, if nothing other than the police coming out getting their information. So what's interesting is um, tree trimming is separate from home improvement. So um, if I say find a person doing home improvement without a license, I can charge them criminally with practicing home improvement without a license. Tree trimming is totally separate. They come under Department of Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. So the Natural Resources Department would have to charge them. Um, and when I was on the police department, I had a pretty good relationship with them. So when I uh, would go out and I would just randomly go out and drive through older neighborhoods and I would find them and I would call Department of Natural Resources and they would come out and charge them with uh, um, tree trimming basically without a license. Um, but yeah, the, the good thing, because a lot of them are drug addicts, unfortunately. So they're going through neighborhoods um, and maybe just looking for tree trimming jobs, but looking for other opportunities also to, to feed their drug habits. But again, it's anyone coming door to door from home improvement to tree trimmings, 
just ignore them. You can contact police um, because they should have a solicitor's license also to solicit any product or door to door in Howard County. Very good. Um, I have a comment here. The sheriff's department scam has been ongoing in Howard County. My parents almost fell victim, but a cashier at Ellicott City Walmart stopped the transaction and called the Howard County Police Department. Their phone rings constantly, all 410, 465, um, or numbers similar to that that are fake. Several claim to be Medicare. I finally had my mom ignore the calls, telling her to let them go to voicemail. It's so bad, I'm trying to talk her into turning off her phone service. So, um, let's see what else we have here. Can I, can I dive in? Oh, on please. This? Yeah, go right ahead, please. Um, I, I feel your pain because, uh, you know, I've been doing this job for a while and I've educated my mom and I'll I'll hear her on the phone about to give someone her personal information or someone from Medicare claiming a call and I'll have to intervene. And it, it it's sort of frustrating because, you know, you've told them over, over and over, just ignore it. But for some reason, a lot of seniors can't ignore it. They just, you know, they don't have in their nature to upset people. And um, I would tell my mom, hey, just hang up the phone. If you don't recognize a number, just just hang it up, hang up. Um, so, yeah, I, I truly understand that's really, really difficult. And they never stop. They never, never stop. Mm -hmm. um, next uh, question. Uh, I've never heard of the state police judicial database. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure, it's a database that was, uh, I think, put into effect probably 10, 11 years ago, uh, probably even longer. So basically, any kind of interactions with the court, whether it's a traffic ticket, whether it's you're being sued civilly, whether you're being charged criminally, that information is accessible to the public. And basically, all you have to do is put a name in, uh, first name and last name, and all that information will come up. Um, years ago, when they first started, they even put dates of birth and your license number. So when we talk about identity theft, if you had a ticket, that's your full name, your full address, your license number, and your date of birth. That's all you need to, to, to initiate identity theft. Now, they backed off from the dates of birth and the um, license number. Um, but yeah, that is easily accessible. Um, if you want to send me an email, I can send you a link to it and, uh, you know, you can, you can look it up. That's one of the things I talk about in the identity theft excuse me, presentation that most people have no idea that, that all that information is publicly accessible. Thank you. Um, one other um, question. If you could please provide details as to how an individual can conduct a background check. Yeah, um, it's through the state police. Um, again, if you can send me an email, your information, I can get you the direct um, link to that. Um, I don't know it offhand, but I do know there's companies that do it or you can go through the state police. Okay. Uh, comment, these scams support the re recommendation that seniors engage a daily money manager to watch the outflow of their money good comments. Um, Elvon Associates is very lucky to have Andre on their side. I'm loving every comment he is stating. Um, agreed. Great. Thank so you. We're <laughs> very fortunate to have been referred to Andre. And we have a, another webinar coming up with Andre about identity theft on March 22nd, which we hope that y'all will consider joining us for. Um, these scams on vulnerable victims are also support for the advice to get long-term care coverage so that professional caregivers can be hired and the potential victims won't need to depend on their family. Another good statement. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. We know someone where one spouse was contacted by a quote grandchild when trouble, in trouble and almost sent money, the other spouse intervened. Uh, statement about Mickey Rooney, um, that, that was quite powerful at the end there. Uh, Mickey Rooney was passionate about being allowed to live his life as he wanted, but many of the scam victims were trying to do what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, 
excellent presentation. What is your website again, please? And I, I'm going to send a follow-up email out to everybody, um, as I typically do, um, with some follow-up information, including Andre's contact information and the website. But again, it is www.elderjusticeandeducation.org. And I'll go ahead and send that out in my follow-up email along with Andre's contact information. Appreciate that. Um, so grateful for Andre's service to Howard County and now to the wider community in his role as expert and advocate for seniors and families. Very much appreciate this presentation. Um, we have a question from one of our good financial advisor friends uh, from BB&T, um, Mr. Jack Safran. Uh, or truest, I should say now. Truest, uh, I'm a truest, member. <laughs> yes, so am I. Yes, long time and former employee. Um, thoughts, recommendations on identity theft insurance. Any feedback on whether they're they've covered claims? Which providers you do or don't like? I haven't heard of them covering claims. Um, not saying that that they do or don't. It's uh, mm -hmm. and maybe I'll do a little more research on that. Um, but probably the biggest thing you can do, and I, you know, I don't want to give away the other <laughs> presentation, but is to uh, get a credit freeze on, on your account, and uh, that will minimize or pretty much stop anyone from opening any credit in your name. Um, but the other monitoring agencies are, are pretty good, um, and you can set it up to, you know, pretty much almost every transaction in your credit card or however you want it set up, you'll get notified from. But uh, what's funny is, uh, well, it wasn't funny. I, I was doing a presentation on identity theft um, while I was on the police department. And one of the videos was playing, I, I get an email saying that someone had just used my credit card at the Walmart in Ellicott City. And here I am doing an identity theft presentation. Again, it you know someone had sc scanned my credit card, got my information, and created a whole new credit card and was was using it. So, and I get into uh, skimmers and all that stuff also, not identity theft. So, great. Unfortunately, it's sort of scares people, but uh, it, it's good information to know. Yeah. You know. And it looks like the last question that we have here, um, as we're rounding out our time. Um, Curious as to why the advice is to pay by check versus credit card for some possible transactions. Um, typically, the door-to-door -door guys don't um, won't take credit cards. They take checks, so they're not really set up as a business. So they'll want you to pay by check or by cash. Right, and I assume in the moment, um, if you know somebody says, "Well, I prefer to give you a credit card." Um, you know, and they say, well, I don't take that, then they'll just go ahead and, and just say, okay, well, I'll right. just give you a check then, so. And again, I, I, I steer totally away from solicitors going door to door, just yeah. saying, hey, you know, looks like, uh, you know, some of your siding's coming down, we can, you know, fix it or whatever, because yeah. they, they'll always come up with something that they can repair, unfortunately. Right, okay, very good. Um, so again, Andre, thank you. Um, just briefly, I'll um, send out a follow-up email with um, today's video, which I hope you share with uh, everybody that you know. Um, a little bit of information about Andre, um, his website. Um, I'll send out his bio again for you as well, along with his contact information. Um, regarding our webinar series, um, this is part of our LVL webinar series for those that are new to our presentations. Uh, we hope you join us again for Andre's presentation on March 22nd about identity theft, the illusion of privacy. Um, since we're uh, running out of time, I won't go through our upcoming presentations, but we do have several um, great presentations uh, in between now and then. So check out our events page uh, on elvoassociates.com slash events, and we hope that you can join us. And um, invitations have gone out to anybody who's on our mailing list um, already for those presentations. So uh, last thing I'll say about um, about uh, powers of attorney, I'm glad you touched on those. Um, we do powers of attorney here at Elvin Associates, of course. Um, for many, the power of attorney is the most important and powerful document um, 
for all the planning documents, but it's important to have one done um, not online. It's important not to do it on your own. Um, and it's very important to choose the proper agent and get counseling regarding that. So if that's something that is uh, a need of yours, feel free to contact us. Um, we can certainly walk you through the process and make it uh, a very easy to get one set up for you. Um, everybody um, should have one that's done properly uh, and in place for um, those important situations that are, might arise in life. So, um, all right, Andre and uh, everybody out there, we appreciate you being here today. And um, thank you so much for being part of the ELVO webinar series. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a safe and wonderful day. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, have a good one.